What is good guys, it is Reed and welcome back to a dope video classes in session. Welcome to episode one of Mentalism 101. The goals of these videos are to provide sort of a step-by-step -step educational video to help you transition from whatever kind of magic you're currently doing into mentalism and specifically focused on playing card magicians transitioning into mentalism and this doesn't have to be a full transition it can be uh, just dabbling or starting to get into it but the reason I want to start this is because I get so many messages and people asking you know how to start getting into mentalism or you know it's hard to start or I don't know what effects to practice on I don't know where to look and so I felt like this could be something very useful. I'm a big mentalism fan, I'm a mentalist myself as well as a playing card magician. I started in playing cards and so I want to kind of give you some insight and take you on the same journey I went through to get to the point where I'm at and getting comfortable where I am performing mentalism. So this is episode one. This is going to be where to start. This is going to be our, our first building block. I'm going to provide you several great tips that can get you started on your journey. Some things to work on, some effects you can start practicing with, and just some, some mindset changes that I think are important when you want to start to get into mentalism. Because it is a unique, a very unique style of magic that I would say is different than all of the others and so there are some things that are important to understand about it. So if you guys like this video and you want to see episode 2 and future episodes of Mentalism 101, please hit that like button and drop a comment to let me know if you enjoyed this video. So let's start off here. Who is this video for? Well, like I kind of said, this video is really for anyone wanting to get into mentalism and it's sort of going to be a almost a class, a step-by-step -step where you can follow these videos and, and work on things and progress with each video and get to a point where you can be comfortable performing some more difficult mentalism routines. One thing with mentalism is it's very hard to practice and it's much different than practicing with playing cards because you can't keep doing the same thing over and over with yourself. At a certain point you need to practice it on real people and typically you can only practice on one person once and then you can't do it on them again so there's that issue you run into as well. So stuff like that makes it very different. Now this is for anyone wanting to get into mentalism but specifically it's going to have an element of transitioning from a playing card magician assuming you have a base in card magic that'll help you a lot as it did with me and I'm going to provide some of those tips that I learned learned as a playing card magician transitioning into more mentalism style effects. And the great thing is I think playing cards and mentalism work really really well together so you can almost practice a lot of your mentalism and have that fallback of playing cards just in case something goes wrong because things will go wrong when you're practicing that's just life. So that's the who, now let's look at the how. How do you go from transitioning from one aspect of magic into specifically mentalism? Well my first thing is going to be we're going to go in baby steps. We're going to start small. This video we're gonna just talk about some tips some things we need to change with our mindset and then I'll leave you with some effects that you can start to work on and practice some that you're familiar with but how we can shift the context into more of a mentalism style uh, sort of routine we're gonna take what we already know the slights we already know the patter we know some of the the verbal uh, cues and things that we say as card magicians or as magicians from other genres and apply those to mentalism in slightly different ways. Rather than trying to build a bunch of new skills, we're going to take the skills we already have and try to improve upon them and work on them. Of course, watching these videos will be a great help and hopefully will be able to guide you along on your journey. So now the, the meat and potatoes of this video, where to start? Uh, there's so many areas, there's so many ways to go. Where do you start? How do you start getting into mentalism? and hopefully that's what this video is, is going to answer for you guys. I'm going to provide you with three or four great tips on where to start and some things that are important from a, a sort of getting your base, getting your feet under you for this. So the first thing is understanding where a lot of the change will be coming from. So my first tip is understanding that 75% of the transition will be in your performance. Okay, It's not necessarily all in the technique. It's not developing some kind of next level intuition or uh, you know some kind of like magical power obviously it's it's about shifting the context of the presentation and there are several ways we can do this and and this will be a whole topic in its own for another video but it's important as a stepping stone to think about that sentence right 75 percent will come with just my performance so that means that we can take a huge base of what we already know and transition it into 
a mentalism route just on what we're saying and just how the effect comes off, which is really powerful. Very honestly, a large portion about performing mentalism is really about the presentation and the way you convey what you're doing to your audience. It's just about changing the context, right? For example, and this will be uh, sort of one of the effects that we'll get into later, but let's say you have a, a playing card and, and you do a force, right? And you reveal it as you had another playing card from a different deck in your pocket that matched the card they selected. Now that's a great trick, but it's a card trick and it's a prediction effect. At the end of the day, that's what it's gonna come across as. It's always gonna feel like a card trick. But you can take that exact same effect with the same method of forcing a card and simply have them look at the card in a very fair way, maybe shuffle it back into the deck or put it in their pocket, and then you can proceed to just do a reading. And if you start with your setup being different, the context and the frame of mind that you put your audience in, it will have a totally different effect on them and it will feel like a feat of mind reading rather than a sleight of hand or a, a card magic sort of feel. So you can see how this can apply to so many different things. And it's really about that context. And it's not just about you being in that frame of mind. I really want you to sit down and think about this particular line and think about how true it really is. But the other thing that's important is to understand that it's about how we shift the context for our audience as well. For example, if we didn't set them up under the premise that the prediction effect that we did was gonna be some kind of mind reading, then that's not what they're gonna be expecting. If you don't set it up that way, no matter how much you try to convince them that now I am reading your mind, they're never gonna have that same feel that they could have. It's important that at the beginning of the performance you set it up in a, in a specific way, whether that's this is gonna be a mental experiment, I'm gonna read your mind, uh, we're gonna use some psychology, whatever it is, you wanna put it in that mentalism box so that when you you know have the actual performance, it's congruent with what you said before and then the reveal kind of ties it all up and really makes it feel like a feat of mentalism. So my second tip for you is to not feel um, like this is a daunting task. You might be looking back at, you know, your time spent learning card magic, right? And I'm sure you loved it and you loved the journey, but if you reflect on where you are now, you're probably way ahead of where you started. So take a moment, applaud yourself. But the point is, you might be looking back and thinking, oh, if I'm starting from scratch again, that's gonna be a ton of work. That's gonna take a long time for me to get from a, a beginner level, as no knowledge level to getting to where I can actually go out and perform. There are people you know, I hear all the time who have been practicing magic for years and years, but they don't perform. And that's totally fine if that's not what you wanna do. But it, it just ends up feeling like a daunting task. But I don't want it to feel like a daunting task because you're, you're already well ahead of the game. You have so many tools at your disposal and a lot of this will be with your card handling abilities. The things you can do with a deck of cards, you can do with a stack of billets, the things you can do with a deck of cards. If you shift the context like I talked about with the first point can still feel very incredible. So it's very important that you understand that you have so many tools already at your disposal and you can use those in so many different ways. You can use them as fail safes, you can use them as outs, you can use them as uh, tools such as peaks. You can use them in so many different ways to just do your mentalism. And, and like I said, 75% of mentalism is in the performance and the shift of context. And so a lot of these same tools we're gonna be able to use in our mentalism journey. So now the third tip I have for you, and the one that I would say is probably the most important, is you need to separate magic and mentalism. Now there's a few reasons for this. One is for yourself. You need to understand the difference in performance, like I sort of mentioned in the first point, between magic and mentalism, and how the context for an audience is completely shifted and you won't exactly understand what I mean until you experience it for yourself in performance. But hopefully some of you who are a little bit more experienced will be able to relate to what I'm saying and can share your stories in the comments. But essentially the other part of this, which I think will help illustrate that first part is that you need to keep them separate because the context and how the audience will experience mentalism is completely different than magic. And that's part of the reason that I tend to say, and I think many people would agree, that mentalism tends to get the best reactions out of anything. Um, I mean, that, that's a general statement, but as a general statement, I would stand behind that, and I've lived through it 
through experience, right? What you have to understand is mentalism is still in an area where it's kind of newer to the general public, to the mainstream. No layman really knows the difference between a mentalist and a magician, right? Uh, unless you've seen one perform, um, you don't really know the difference unless you've really seen like someone who just refers to themselves as a mentalist and just does mentalism. But at the end of the day, any kind of other trick like a card trick or anything like that still falls as a magic trick. Now the interesting thing with mentalism and when you get out there and start performing in this and this wasn't something I learned until I started performing was that there's still a gray area and I'm not sure like I said if that's because it's a little bit newer but I, I really think it has something to do with mentalism not being as in the mainstream and not being as widely known about as like just being a standard magician or a card magician like it, being a mentalist is much less known people don't really know if it's real or not. That's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. I think another big factor that plays into it is how close it ties to like psychics and mediums and you know, fortune tellers and all these things that uh, you know, we have that exist that are controversial if they're whether they're real or not. I think there's a sort of, we kind of get lumped into that category as well. Um, you also have the, you know, the things that are real, like, you know, body reading and some of the psychological things that like, you know, profilers do and real psychology that does exist. And some of that you actually do use as methods to mentalism in, in certain aspects. There are some really neat psychological techniques, but also a lot of that is just pseudo that we use as part of our story. And because of that, it makes it feel a lot more real. So hopefully that kind of conveyed the to you and you can see now why you need to keep them separate because if you conflate them too much, it just becomes another trick. It just lumps in with all the rest of your magic. And at the end of the day, no matter how astonishing a trick is, most people will often believe, okay, it's just a trick. And that doesn't mean it takes away from the, um, the effect or the reactions that they have, but at the end of the day, they'll always know in the back of their mind or sometimes they'll vocalize it that, hey, that was a good trick, right? And with any kind of magic besides mentalism, that's totally fine because that just being a trick, it's kind of known to everyone that that's what it is. And it's one of those things that you can, like with a card trick, you know, instead of, oh, it's just a trick, you know, if someone says that to me, I, you know, I respond with, well, it's really a skill. It's, a, it's all the skill and time I've put in. And people can generally appreciate that and, and really see that. But with mentalism, when you say it's a trick, it's that one genre of magic that really, it hinders the effect extremely. Keeping it in that gray area of real or not and i'm not saying you need to go tell everyone that it's real and you can actually read minds but that's why i love to go the sort of psychological route i just you know hype up it's about it being body reading and psychology and and you know little things like this that i'm picking up on it keeps it in that gray area and it makes it feel so much more real and because we we already are in lumped in this category with psychics and all these things it's already in people's sort of um bias to believe that it has some level of, of realness to it. And so you have to understand that there has to be some level of separation between the two. So what I usually do, and, and here's a, a big real thumb, something you can take away and, and actively use uh, from this video is, you know, I do pretty much cards and mentalism, right? So I usually will start out with uh, some cards because it's a good place to start. You know, I'm com very, very comfortable, less risk involved and also the mentalism later is gonna hit harder. In my experience, it always does, so I always follow with it. But I always transition. There's a transition point where I make it very clear that, hey, you know, this was sleight of hand, you know, card magic, as people understand, and now I'm gonna try to get in your head. I'm gonna try to, you know, or do some readings and some stuff like that. I don't say, now I'm gonna show you some other kinds of magic tricks, right? even though that's essentially what it is. So I always make sure I'm vocal about the context shift that we're going from magic tricks to mental experiments, right? Uh, I think that's vital. Again, understanding that there's a difference between the two and it's important to keep that separation is important because people already see 
the mind reading stuff as potentially real and if we can take advantage of that that is vital to keeping the effect at its maximum potential and that's i think the reason why mentalism gets such amazing reactions because it has a level of realness to it that no other type of magic can really recreate in my opinion so just keep that in mind when you're performing and when you're thinking about this think about what i've said here and think about how that can apply to you because I think it's a really important frame of mind to be in and something that really honestly keeping it in that gray area really helps keep your effects high because if you can imagine being in someone's shoes where they just feel like you got inside their mind or even if you didn't if they just believe like oh he was using my body language and psychology that's a real powerful thing to feel like someone can get that kind of information out of you from just that and the second you say oh no that was just a, a trick right it becomes okay let me figure out how that was done and it becomes oh you know this is just a, a bunch of bs so let me just sit here and you know okay it was cool it was just another another trick but with you know with cards it, it's obvious there's a physical skill with your hands that they can almost see when you're handling the cards like obviously they're not seeing the slights hopefully <laughs> yeah that'd be great if they you know could see all the moves and they know you're so good <laughs> you wouldn't fool anyone but point is uh, with the mentalism, it's a lot more in the verbiage and you are doing some level of reading and more advanced stuff and and some of the, the other things that, you know, there's not a place for you to point to where it can be like, this is my skill, this is what I'm doing. So you, you can't really give them that, you know, sleight of hand answer as to that thing that, you know, you can just say, oh yeah, it's just sleight of hand and people will walk away from that feeling like, okay, I kind of understand how this worked doesn't take away from the effect because they don't understand but it gives them something and it is important to give a little bit to people to keep them interested but with mentalism there's not much to give them so keeping it in that sort of real gray area realm gives them something to hold on to but in such a more powerful way that they really truly have no idea and feel like you did something absolutely incredible that they've never seen now my fourth tip is going to be to start with easy effects uh, i'm going to give you some different effects some different ideas and different things you can start to work on not all of these are super long effects some of them are just ideas but these are things that if you've never done any mentalism they're great places to start and even if you have some of the tips i'll give you on how to change your your frame of mind and your reference when doing these i think is really important so the first thing is going to be a recommendation not necessarily an effect but if you go check out my good friend uh, Nathan Lindley at Abraxas he put out some really funny shorts of magic moves for mentalism and they're actually very useful he gives you very simple moves like the double lift and uh, a false shuffle and stuff like that and how you can use these magic moves for mentalism and that's a, a huge sort of takeaway from this video so i'll link those videos below make sure you go check those out they're just like 60 second videos and there's like four or five of them so you can get a few little ideas of what i'm going to talk about so the first effect is something i've already kind of mentioned and it's the idea of taking that card force and making it a prediction a couple things you need to think about when you do something like this is i want you to first Again, set up that context in a totally different light. Don't even come out with the deck in hand. Start the intro to your effects, your setup without the deck, right? Because as a mentalist, we don't need that deck. Even better, if you have, you know, maybe snaps, the snaps deck or ABC by Spidey or something like that, you can, you know, a deck with pictures on it, you can get away from the playing card feeling, you know, even more, but, if you start out by saying, you know, I want to try to get into your head here, I'm going to try a little bit of a mental experiment, see if, if we're a good match, see if I can get a reading because, you know, getting into someone's mind, not only does it take a good reader, it takes someone who's good at transmitting that thought so I can pick up on it. So you see how I've just shifted the context now into something completely different. Next thing you're going to want to do is, is take out the deck of cards, but not as something that is really super important for the effect. So for example, you either if you can take it out nonchalantly and just have it ready or if you need to bring attention to it you can but you just take it out and you say let's just use these as, a, as an example even better if the deck is already set out off to the side you say you know we need something for this experiment here and you look around and then you you know grab the deck and, and it feels nonchalant now you don't want to necessarily come out and start handling this like you know you're an advanced sleight of hand artist because there's no need to, right? If you were a mentalist, there's no need for sleight of hand. So, you know, especially if you can use a marked deck for this. A marked deck is great because of how hands off you can be in having them draw out the card. You know, we don't need to get into methods so much here because the method doesn't matter. Whether you want to use my spread force, 
where, let's see, we'll force the five of hearts here so they can come through, pick any card, let's say this one right here, and you just show it to them for a second and you hand the deck e instantly to be shuffled. That would work wonderful if you want to do a cross-cut force where they look at it, if you want to use a marked deck where they pick out a card, you know, just make it feel free. Just, you know, spread that deck on the table, have them take out a card, get your reading, whatever it happens to be. But the only thing for the method is make it feel hands off. It's great if you can turn your head away, just really make it clean and that there's no way that you could have seen it. So my, like I said, my favorite way, I'd just do a spread force where I'd come through. I already know what card I'm forcing, so I force it. I'm looking away the whole time. They get a small glimpse and I instantly hand it out to shuffle. There's no way I could have seen that card, right? So now from here, it's about the reveal. Like I said, 75% comes down to the presentation. So you can see how some a lot of these tips I've given you are trans, transitioning here. We've shifted the context, we're gonna change the presentation now, we're using tools that we already have, and we're keeping this separate from magic being a card trick. And you can hopefully feel how this is totally different feeling trick and context. So for reveals, we could do something like a lie detector plot, which is a really great place to start. And I have a video on that, so I will link it here and you can go check that out and it's really just this effect and I just go into how to reveal it in a fun way. So the idea there is you're revealing stages of it. You, you say, you know, we're going to play a bit of a truth and a lie game. You can lie to me, tell the truth, and I'm just going to try to read what you're doing. You know, if we're trying to go for mentalism, you know, there, there are apps. There's like a lie detector app where you can like set it to say true or false. So you could have their finger, they put their finger on it and it pretends to read them and it'll say true or false. Now that's a good magic trick, but again, that takes away from the mentalist feel where trying to get into their mind here so for that reveal it's all gonna be verbal you know do little things like if you know be, be respectful make sure it's uh, consensual but you can grab someone's hand put your hand on their shoulder uh, you know make eye contact make it feel powerful build up what you can to try to get it as real feeling as, as you can you know like I said people are already here with card tricks they know it's a trick right it's very rare that you'll have people who actually think it's real magic it does happen still but they're already here on the ter in terms of believing it's real. So we wanna keep them up here, right? And when people ask you, like I said, is it real, is it a trick? You, you just keep it ambiguous. You just say, you know, I'm reading your body language, I'm using psychology and a bunch of different techniques to do my best to get my best, you know, guess and feel at what you might be thinking of. So back to the plot, we're gonna take time, we're gonna draw this out, we're gonna get lots of little hits because we can just get one hit and name the card that we forced or we can get lots of little hits and now it feels like we're actually reading something and getting a lot out of this right we're gonna we can ask the color uh you know is it black card and then they answer and now we say you're lying or telling the truth then we can do it with the suit we can do it with the value being you know a face card or a number card we can do if it's a number card we can you know divide the range in half and say below five above five then we can sort of narrow in on a number we can do this with other people, right? If we force the card and a few different people see, now we can pretend we're getting readings on multiple people. So that's sort of the lie detector idea. Other ways to do it would be, you know, you could just grab someone's hand and get a feeling like that. Just different techniques to reveal it, having someone repeat the number over and over in their mind and, and you know, keep going and going and and just having them keep repeating it and then you just start going through and you just start repeating it as well with them so they're going through and you're just like yes seven 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 and then you get that smile because it feels like because they're repeating it and you start repeating it now there's this moment where they're saying it over and over in their mind and then you start saying it out loud and it syncs up only to them in their head and they get this big sort of feeling of oh my god he's actually hearing how i'm saying it other things like having them, I love this one where if you have a whiteboard or like a chalkboard or a big somewhere you can write, you know, and you have them face away from it and you write the name of their card or whatever the piece of information is in big letters so everyone else can see it, then they are not looking and you have them reveal it for the first time. Now everyone knows what it is, knows that you got it right and you have this really nice visual of you drawing it big on the board everyone else saw you draw it and then this person names it without having seen it and they end up matching so different things like that to shift that context right we, we're shifting from this force prediction effect that we might do with this and switching it to a more mentalism-esque reading piece now you can do predictions and mentalism for sure but you got to handle it in a different way you know you got to set up the premise of this is going to be psychological influence and you got to give them a little bit as to how you did it like if you wanted to force the seven of hearts you might do sort of that idea where as you're talking you draw seven in the air and you gesture lightly with seven fingers and then later you can call back to those moments as you're kind of explaining how you did it 
and now it feels like that sort of psychological influence aspect, right? And just different ways to build up the effect. You know stigmata, for example, that's a great way to just reveal something that feels incredible, uh, like very on that edge of mentalism, real creepy sort of vibes that it is just really good for anything. It just comes down to how you reveal it. So play around with that effect. You can go with the lie detector plot, you can go all these different plots, but remember, focus on shifting the context, using the tools we already have, separating it from the idea of it just being magic, and then understanding that a lot of this is just coming down to the presentation. At least for simple effects like this, where we're using tools we already have. My last little tip and sort of challenge or something for you to try out would be to take your favorite ACAN that you do, whatever one it happens to be, and make it a prediction effect, right? So we're gonna take an ACAN and turn it into sort of a mentalism effect. So instead of them, you know, naming a card, dealing down, finding the card, if you can change it to the context of, you know, I have a lucky card in the deck that I have written down here and you have it written on a piece of paper and you say it's somewhere in the deck and I'm gonna try to send that position to you and I want you to, you know, get a feeling of where that position is. Maybe you do something like that. Or they name a card and now you say, all right, I'm gonna try to get a feeling of where that card is in the deck, or even you look and you just say, okay, I, I know where that card is, I'm gonna try to send it to you, name any number, they deal down to the number, they find that card there. So you can see how we're changing the context. You know, If you know some more advanced techniques, you could do it like a prediction in an envelope where you explain that everything was already predetermined beforehand, which Again, if you're doing that, we need to make it feel like, okay, we're influencing them and, and give them a little bit as to how we're doing that. So you might have the number and the card that they're gonna say already written down. And again, if you know more advanced techniques, you can figure out a way to do that, but you can then have them name any card, name any number, deal down, find the card of that number. And then you say, you know, this envelope that's been here the whole time has predicted and shown you the proof that you know, I was able to influence you. And again, you'd set this up as I'm gonna to try to influence you to say a specific card, a specific number, so it's all congruent, right? And you give them a little bit, you, you do something as to that they can think back, okay, that's the moment he influenced me. Come up with a random spiel about walking down the beach on the ocean and you, you see some rocks on the side. I, I use this, that, this all the time. And you know, you see this and that, and you hear this and that, and you hear the waves crashing and you see this and you feel the colors. And, and then you can just call back to that and you say that this is what I use to influence you. You don't even necessarily need to explain how, but it's as simple as taking something that, you know, a red card and and having something red in that image you describe to them, or if you can work in the number or the suit, right, a diamond, you can maybe talk about like a, a ring or something like that. So it's really, really easy to shift this context and you just need to kind of think about it. If you want an idea of how you can do a, a prediction style where you have the the card predicted, the number is, is typically more dif difficult unless you're doing some kind of big multiple outs or some kind of pocket writing or where you have something of those of that sort the numbers more difficult the card can be easier so if you wanted to you know do a prediction effect where you have an envelope and you do an any card any number and at the end you have both the number and the card that they said and it was all influence uh, i'll give you a tip on how you could do the card you could use the equivocate from the um recent video I posted and so you go through you give them that little story you paint that picture in their mind maybe have them close their eyes that's another great technique it just feels like something's happening you know touch their shoulder walk them through this visual process and then when you go through the equivocate process at the end you can call back and you say all those different decisions you made were all because of you know this influence that I told you through the story and then you can have that card already written on the envelope inside right and it's a it's incredible effect you predicted it you influenced them and it's really really neat and it has that mentalism feel and that's how you can do the card so if you want to practice that i'll link that video there and you can check that out so guys that is it for episode one of mentalism 101 let me know what you guys thought hopefully this was educational and useful if nothing else um this video is sort of like a like a good intro to this we'll get into more techniques in the next couple of videos and you know, we'll probably spend one video on sort of a, each technique and some basic stuff that you can actually get practicing that is new maybe for you if you're less experienced. And if you're more experienced, it'll hopefully uh, give you some new ideas with these techniques. And then we'll start to look at some different effects and simple things that we can do with it and how to really transition. Then we'll have some a lot of theoretical videos too about um, 
you know, the thoughts about my thoughts and ideas going into mentalism. This, these videos are sort of like how to make your magic better, but for mentalism. And uh, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to like and leave me a comment. If you'd like to fast track your journey to mentalism, if you'd like to work on something specific, playing card related or mentalism related, send me an email, rfslights at gmail.com. We can set up a private lesson one-on-one uh, -on -one, and we can go through, you know, some of these more advanced techniques that I haven't got into yet and really get you to where you need to be. You know, if we can sit down one-on-one, -on -one, I can really know what you need to work on and we can take it from there. So with all that said, guys, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next video.